Well, good morning, Long Hollow. Great to be with you. Thank you for the kind introduction. I am Ben Mandrell, I'm the president of Lifeway Christian Resources, and just wanna say thank you for partnering with Lifeway. I've been there for about three years. We've gone through a season of reinvention. And before we hop right into the word, let me just say a couple things about Lifeway, just so you kind of know where we are as an organization. Many of you work at Lifeway, so thanks for being great team members. Uh, Just five quick things, then we'll jump into the sermon. So first of all, Lifeway has an award-winning website. Newsweek gave us a great award last week. We're in the top five best in our category of online shops. So if you haven't been to lifeway.com to see our Bibles, Bible studies, all the things we do, hopefully you'll check back there uh, and see what's going on. Second of all, I wanna tell you about the Telugu Study Bible. Uh, Lifeway created this study Bible for a language group in India called Telugu. 90 million people speak this language. It's the first ever study Bible of its kind in India. The pastor you see on the left helped write the notes for the study Bible. When he saw it in his hotel, he wept because there is nothing like this in India. When we produced it, 2,000 pastors lined up to get their copy, and now they're moving into five other language groups throughout the nation, throughout the whole entire continent of India. So it's amazing what God is doing in India, and Lifeway gets to be a part of it. Third thing I want to tell you real quick is uh, we see the Spanish-speaking church in America growing dramatically, and we have moved into a new strategy. Rather than just take English resources created by English-speaking Americans and translating them into Spanish. In 2015, we had zero Hispanic authors. Today, we have 53 Hispanic authors who live in Central America and South America who are writing to their language groups, creating resources. So Lifeway is moving in a global way, connecting with churches around the country. And then I wanna talk about our camps real quick. I preached at Student Life Camp this week, but uh, we have about 100,000 kids this summer in camp. But last year, we had 88,000 kids in camp. We had 1,400 make decisions for Christ and almost $445,000 were given to missionaries from leftover concessions money, the kids at all the camps. So uh, thank you. This is just amazing how much you send your money you send to camp with your kids. It's awesome. Um, And so uh, it's just an awesome thing to be a part of reaching the next generation. And then Vacation Bible School, right now throughout the entire country, we have Vacation Bible School going on. This year it's been Spark Studios, next year it's Twist and Turns, and our Vacation Bible School stuff continues to be more and more kids coming to receive Christ uh, through Vacation Bible School. And thank you for all of you who serve with kids and students, because it is the next generation. And then finally, I just wanna make you aware of a podcast that my wife and I started called The Glass House. If you ever wanna know what Robbie and Candy go through, listen to a couple episodes of The Glass House. It's interviews with pastors and wives about what it's like to live your life out in the open and deal with all your own stuff and all your own challenges and all your own things. The topics are arranged according to emotions, so they're, they're actually very relevant to anybody who listens, but I, I try to encourage everyone who attends a church to listen to a few episodes of The Glass House. You will pray for your pastor and his wife with greater intensity uh, after doing so. So today, if you brought a Bible, I'd like to ask you to turn to the book of Esther in the Old Testament. The title of my message is The Pursuit of More. A wise man once said, if the grass seems greener on the other side of the fence, you need to water your lawn. Why do we as human beings pine for more, more, and more? Why do we resonate with the words of Hamilton, he will never be satisfied? There's something within all of us that we feel like we need just a little more approval, just a little more praise, a little more recognition, a a little more um, uh, applause from people. If we could just get a little more accomplishment, a little more success, we're on the search for something and yet we're never satisfied. Even in the beginning documents of our country, it says that we are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But this thing called happiness keeps getting pushed out just a little bit further. They keep moving the goalposts on happiness. And so we spend our lives searching for this thing that we want, and yet we never really get it. This feeling of arrival that keeps getting delayed. A secular non-religious writer named Mark Manson wrote a piece called Happiness is a Problem. And in it, he writes this. Whatever makes us happy today will no longer make us happy tomorrow. A fixation on happiness inevitably amounts to a never ending pursuit of something else. A new house, new relationship, another child, another pay raise. And despite all of our sweat and pain, we end up feeling eerily similar to how we started, inadequate. And even though Mark Manson isn't a believer in Christ, I think he speaks to a quest that we all feel at times. It's the book of Ecclesiastes. 
It's this hedonic treadmill, this desire that we want more and more pleasure, more and more success, and yet we never really feel like we've arrived. The Bible ultimately addresses this issue. If you think the Bible is irrelevant, it doesn't speak to relevant issues, it speaks to this issue in so many places. And I wanna take you to a place today in the book of Esther, it's in the Old Testament, and meet, I want you to meet a man named Haman, who represents the dark side of all of us. So if you're new to scripture, maybe you're brand new to the Bible, you stumbled into church today with a friend who begged you to come along, you've never been around scripture or Christians before, let me just tell you what you're about to look at. The Bible is not just a book, but a collection of 66 books. There's an Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the part of the story that leads up to the birth of Jesus and Christmas. It's kind of the backstory that gives the breadth and depth of the entire life and narrative of Jesus. And if you zoom in on the Old Testament alone, the books of the Old Testament are arranged according to genre. And in the historical section of the Old Testament, there's this one book called Esther. And inside it, we need a man named Haman, who is the poster boy for pining. His life ends in disaster because he could not get happy with what he had. And he had been given so much. Esther is a story of a young woman who rises from zero to hero. She was a Jewish teenager living in a foreign land ruled by an egomaniac king. And when that king was publicly humili humiliated, he put the queen away and sought out a new queen. He cast her aside and a beauty contest was announced. And it's kind of an Old Testament episode of The Bachelor. And all these beautiful women are brought and he selects one. Esther is the woman of destiny. She's born unusually beautiful. The first time we meet Esther, it's in chapter two, verse seven, it says this. The young woman had a beautiful figure and she was extremely good looking. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his family. So right there, we get two pieces of information about Esther. She was beautiful and she was broken. On the outside, she was a picture of perfection. But on the inside, lost, scared, hopeless, without parents. Esther is this destined beauty, but her life is filled with so much uncertainty. She had lost everything. Mordecai, her uncle, would be the rock of her life, but Mordecai would also be the rock in Haman's shoe the one thing that Haman couldn't quite shake. Now you need to know this, when Esther is announced as queen on the very same day, Haman is promoted to chief of staff in the kingdom, a highly sought after position. He gets a huge promotion on the same day that Esther becomes queen. It says this in chapter three and verse two, after all this took place, the king honored Haman. He promoted him in rank and gave him a higher position than all the other officials. That's a pretty sweet gig. The entire royal staff, in fact, at the king's gate, bows down and pays homage to Haman because the king had commanded this to be done for him, but Mordecai would not bow down or pay homage. So get this, Haman gets promoted to second in command, not just gets the promotion, but the king commands that all the other VPs, as he's walking into the city gate, they all bow down and pay him honor. I mean, I'd call that an Instagram day. I would call that a pretty good moment in your life. And yet on the day he gets everything he's ever dreamed of, he allows one person to steal all of his joy. Mordecai's decision to remain standing when the VIPs are bowing down is enough to send him into a rage. It's a trigger, a little bomb that goes off deep in his heart that detonates and it becomes the downfall of his life. Now, I'm glad that it's just an Old Testament thing that human beings used to let one person rob them of all of their joy in life. <laughs> Aren't you thankful that's something that we've graduated from? What is wrong with us? When we're in a room full of people, we find one person least impressed by us and we supersize their fries. We give them more. There can be this long parade of people that approve of us who, think us who think that we're a wonderful person, but there's just this one person that has unsubscribed from my social media and it eats me alive. Just pause for a moment and think about that person in your life. Don't point at them or look at them. <laughs> they could be sitting right next to you at this very moment. This one person that has the power to steal all of your joy in life 
Now just think about that person and with their face in your mind, listen to the New Testament writer, James. James chapter four, verse one, what is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? You desire and you do not have. What does James reveal about the human heart here? He says that the reason you are not at peace is probably not another person's problem. It's probably something going on inside of you. It's misplaced passion. This person stands in the way of something that you want. You desire something and you're not getting it. And so what is that thing that this person isn't giving you that you feel like you need in order to feel whole? When you start asking that question, now you're asking the right question. Mordecai never stops to ask that question. He never stops to look inside his heart, even though scripture says, above all things, guard your heart, for from it, it's the wellspring of life. The most important thing about you right now is what's building up in your heart. So Mordecai saw in his mind from the time he was a teenager, clearly something he wanted was for the entire room of people to adore him. But when it didn't happen, he blamed it all on this one person. Verse five, when Haman saw that Mordecai was not bowing down or paying him homage, he was filled with rage. And when he learned of Mordecai's ethnic identity, it seemed repugnant to Haman to do away with Mordecai alone. He planned to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, through Ahasuerus' kingdom. So it's, it's Haman. Now, the sin inside of Haman spreads from one person now to a significant large group of people. In fact, it says that Haman in verse five, notice this, he is filled up with rage. Esther was written in the Hebrew language. That original language, the word rage, it means heat, poison, venom, or wrath. When Haman saw that this one person was rounding down on him, the reservoir of his heart was filled up with poison. And Haman switches from the hatred of one person who is poisoning him now to an entire group of people. This is how sin spreads when it goes unchecked. If you don't watch every day what's going on in your heart, you're in real trouble. This is why Paul says to young Titus, watch your life and your doctrine closely. It's not just what you believe about the Bible or about the world that matters. It's what's going on in your life. It's what's going on in your heart. My wife and I, uh, for the last three years, have been seeing a counselor pretty regularly. Uh, We were in pastoral ministry for 17 years. I was in Jackson, Tennessee for 12. Then we moved and planted a church in Denver, Colorado from scratch. And uh, that church grew and was a success story. But as soon as we moved the church into a building, God called us back to lead Lifeway through this series of reinvention. And when we got off the treadmill of being a pastor and leading a church, we began to realize that a lot of poison had stored up in our marriage. See, when you're a pastor and every Sunday you're on, you, you wanna think twice about bringing up anything explosive with your wife, because it blows up, you gotta put it back together on Saturday night. You gotta be seen publicly on Sunday, and let's just face it, the church doesn't really like it when the pastor and his wife aren't getting along. And so for years, that was kind of our, our deal. Things would happen in our marriage, and we would just put it away, would deal with it down the road. Well, the time came to pay the bill. When we came to Lifeway, we're no longer leading in every Sunday church. And we started going to counseling and start talking through some of the poisons. And there was this anger that had grown between us, hardness of heart. And so I agreed to go to counseling because I was certain that some guy with a diploma on the wall would help her see that she'd gone nuts. I'm really not joking. That's why I said yes. So we get into the first counseling session. I assume he understands that we're here for her. And he starts asking me all of these questions. And and through the line of questioning, I begin to see that I, I want something from her and she's not giving it to me. The reason I resent her is that I want something and I do not have it. And what I want is for her to realize that I am awesome that she is really blessed to be married to me. (laughs) Paul Tripp, a pastor, wrote a book called A Dangerous Calling. He tells the story about a season of fighting that he and his wife went through when he was pastoring a church. He writes these words. On one occasion, as my wife Luella was confronting me with yet another instance of my anger, I got on a roll. And I actually said these deeply humble words, 95% of the women in our church would love to be married to a man like me. And Luella quickly informed me that she was in the 5%. (laughs) 
That's where Lindley and I were that day in counseling. And as humbling as it is to admit, I did not know all of the poison that was in my heart. In one particular session, it was my turn to talk and I was being challenged on a situation and our counselor looked at me and said, why does this make you so angry? And I said, I'm not angry. And I realized in that moment, I, how slow I am to see myself as I am. Christians aren't supposed to be angry, but I was. And going back to the text, when Haman saw that Mordecai was not bowing down or paying him homage, it says he was filled up with rage. He was ignoring this inner heat. He was not seeing how his own issues were now coloring his life and warping his perspective, consuming him from the inside. The problem with Haman was not Mordecai. The problem with Haman was Haman. And his life tells the story of what happens to any person who ignores his own pain. Soon Esther will discover that Haman's plan is to wipe out her people. She is overwhelmed with fear when this happens. Mordecai challenges her to use her position to save the Jews. And here's the most famous verse in all of the story. Uncle Mordecai says this to her in Esther chapter four and verse 14. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place, but you and your father's family will be destroyed. Who knows perhaps? you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Read the whole story of Esther. It'll take you like 30 minutes. This young untested queen must take on the ultimate risk of her life to expose the king's highest official. It was a great risk. He had no problem in the past putting queens away. But she musters the courage. She sticks her neck out. She spills the beans to the king about her identity as a Jew, about Haman's evil plot. And the king speaks up in chapter seven and verse five and asks Queen Hester, Esther, who is this and where is this person who would devise such a scheme? I think the original language casts light on the depth of the king's inquiry. The actual original language says, who is this and where is this person who would fill up his heart to do this? You are the only person who is aware you and God, of what is presently filling up your heart. Guard your heart, for from it is the very wellspring of life. You know, this is not the only place in the Bible where fill up his heart shows up. It actually shows up thousands of years later in a New Testament story. Fast forward a couple thousand years to the birth of the early church in the book of Acts. The apostles are nurturing this baby community, Christians, and and a rich couple comes along named Ananias and Sapphira who have stepped up to make a large, insizable donation to the building fund. What seemed like an act of kindness, however, was exposed as a pretentious gift with lies attached to it. The gift was good, their hearts were bad. And when Peter figures out that this whole thing has been a charade, he confronts the situation in Acts chapter five, verse three. Ananias, Peter said, why has Satan filled up your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? Notice the language. There was a filling of the heart that Ananias allowed. He was responsible for the state of his own heart. And the story of Haman and the story of Ananias end in the same tragic way. Both of them, their very lives are taken from them because they could not tend to what was going on inside of their heart under the surface. So at the end of chapter seven, when the king finally gets the full picture, he makes a swift decision to bring justice. This is what it says in chapter seven, verse nine. Harbona, one of the king's eunuchs said, there is a gallows 75 feet tall at Haman's house that he made for Mordecai who gave the report that saved the king and the king said, hang him on it. And they hanged Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. And then the king's anger subsided. The story of Haman is a man who was murdered by his own emotions. When you refuse to forgive someone, it is the meanest and most cruel thing you can ever do to yourself. It fills up your heart with poison. 
whether that person is your spouse, whether that person is your ex-spouse, whether that person is your ex-boss, whether that person is your neighbor, whether that person is yourself, well, it, the longer you keep that person on the hook, the more miserable and the less chance of happiness you have. One of my favorite ways to end a sermon is to ask the text some questions. And I try to think about questions from different categories of people in the room. Some of you have walked with Christ for many years. You know the Bible inside and out. So you have a certain set of questions. And there's others who are good-hearted skeptics who come who don't know the Bible, ask legitimate questions. And then there's students who ask the best questions and the ones that the adults are afraid to say out loud. So I have a question from each of those audiences based on this text. A seasoned Christian might say this, I struggle with wanting more power and more influence in my job. Is it wrong for me to want to be the boss in charge? Well, I'd first say it's completely human to want to be influential. I think God puts that in our hearts to want to make a difference and the largest difference that we can to maximize our potential, to be an an all-star in whatever field we pursue. Whatever you do, do it to, with all of your heart, the Bible says. So if you're gonna be a pastor, why not be a great pastor? If you're gonna be a surgeon, why not try to be a great surgeon? If you're gonna be an engineer, why not try to be one of the best engineers? There's nothing bad about ambition, but there's a shadow side to it. There are two primary ways, according to a counseling friend of mine, to view your life. And I want you to listen to this very carefully. You either have a destination mindset or you have a journey mindset. If you have a destination mindset, the people in your life that come along are either obstacles in the way of your happiness or tools to get what you want in life. This is clearly seen in the early days of Jesus and his disciples. The 12 appeared to be following Jesus for all the right reasons. And yet James and John pull their mother into the corner with Jesus and say, can we have the two best seats in the house? They clearly weren't following Jesus for the kingdom and the mission and the saving of souls. They were in it for themselves, at least at first. And when you have a destination mindset, a place you want to get in life, every person you encounter is either an obstacle in your way or a tool that you can use to get there. And you become a manipulator or a user of people. And I've done that in my life. I have done it. I'm guilty. We handed off the church in Denver to a new pastor, but on the seventh anniversary, they had me come back. And I had had some time to process and think, and I preached this very text. And I confessed to the church that I think there had been times that I used people to get something that I wanted. A couple of weeks later, I got back and I had a, pay, I had a piece of snail mail, which doesn't happen all that much anymore. It's from an elderly woman in the church, a sweet woman that I knew loved me. And she said in the letter, she said, Ben, I'm so glad that the Lord has revealed this to you because I can't tell you how many Sundays after service I would come and try to speak to you. And I felt like your eyes were always scanning the room for someone more important. And I wrote her back and told her how deeply sorry I am. Because sometimes ambition gets the best of me and I use people to get what I want and I'm angry at them when they don't help me get where I wanna go. And that is sin and it's wrong and it's what James says, it's a passion within you that destroys relationships. But when you live with a journey mindset, it's a beautiful way to live your life because you're on a journey and God's in control of the journey. In his heart, a man's plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps, Proverbs 69. So when you have a journey mindset, you can just go on the journey of life and the people that come alongside you are the best part. Your competitors are now your companions and you're traveling along life's way and God knows where he has you today and he knows where he's gonna take you. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion into the day of Jesus Christ. So you don't have to worry about using people, manipulating people or trying to get what you want from them. God is gonna give you the desires of your heart if you'll just trust him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these things will be added unto you. And if you live with that journey mindset, which Jesus provides to his followers, you don't have to worry about spending your life stepping on people to get to the top. So is it wrong to wanna to be the boss? It depends. It depends on why you wanna be the boss. 
Without faith, it's impossible to please God. As long as it's all about the glory of God, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be influential. A good-hearted skeptic asks this question. Christians seem to be just as angry as everybody else, so why should I put my faith in Jesus if, Jesus if nothing's gonna change for me either? That's a legitimate question. I have non-religious friends who would say they think they're morally superior than more, most Christians they know. So it's a fair question. Why buy a fitness membership if every person coming out of the door is overweight? And the answer is twofold. Number one, you don't know how much they weighed when they started. And number two, not everybody goes to the gym is working out. It's understandable that non-believing people feel like Christians are hypocrites because they seem angry. But the Bible never suggests that the church is a place of nearly perfect people. If you look at, at a, in a judgmental way at a Christian and wonder why they're so angry, you don't know where they've come from, what their story is, how much God has delivered them from things of their past, where they are in their journey of sanctification because we're all in the middle of spiritual growth. So who are we to judge another person's spiritual life? You don't know how many things Christ has set them free from. And not only that, when you look at a Christian who claims to be a Christian, you don't really know if they're authentically following Jesus, even though they claim to be. So the greatest Christian in history is a guy named Paul. He wrote all these books, all those. If you've written more books than Paul, would you just stand? We wanna honor you. <laughs> I mean, he was one incredible Christian. I mean, who, who could say Paul was pretty good, I'm better. And yet Paul, even in the height of his ministry to Christ, he writes these words in Romans chapter seven, verses eight through 18 through 19. For I know that nothing good lives inside of me that is in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there's no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. This is the apostle Paul saying, you might think I've got it all together. I have good days and bad days. Days where I have long suffering patience with people and days where I have a short fuse. So if you're not a Christian and you look at Christians and you wonder why they don't have it all together, nobody in the room claims to. In fact, the reason we're here and not home and on a couch is because we recognize how weak we are, but in our weakness, we are made strong when we join a community of people who are all striving together to, gra to not graduate from grace, but to accept grace as the ongoing dominant way of our lives. And so Paul is not saying that he has not made any progress or that he has not grown. He's simply confessing that he's a work in progress and we all are. And I would say this to you, Christians are often blamed for being judgmental. And I have observed in 45 years of my life that being judgmental goes both ways. And if you judge Christians, perhaps you should come inside and get to know us and experience the grace that we're talking about. A student in the student ministry would ask something like this. How do I deal with my anger toward God? I'm often angry because classmates seem to be more talented, more athletic, and more extraordinary than I am. First, I would say that the snare of compare does not end with adolescence. It's an adulting thing too. All of us struggle with feelings of, in, you know, feeling inferior. It's like a month ago, I think, I was at breakfast with a guy named Robbie Gallaty. He was sitting right here he had a t-shirt on and I was noticing the fabric around his sleeve. <laughs> I, I really was. If it could talk, it seemed to be saying, help me. <laughs> like, this is a hard way to live. And he was talking, I wasn't listening to what he was saying, I was just watching his arm move. <laughs> My t-shirts have always been quite relaxed. And I was just like, what would it be like for a day to feel tightness on your arm <laughs> like that? And then I, my, my, my head comes back to his face and it's so amazingly hairy. <laughs> I'm 45 and still hoping this is growing out at some point. And I'm, I'm there with Robbie and I'm realizing like, I'm never gonna experience this. He is just a massive person. And my kids tell me, look, I, I look like Bob Saget off Full House. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And you think that when you get in your 40s, that doesn't happen anymore. I'm telling you, it's high school every day with me. <laughs> it never ends. It's called the snare of compare. You're always gonna meet people that are more intelligent, more athletic, seem to have it more together than you. And there's gonna be this moment in your life and it's gonna happen again and again where you look into the mirror and you doubt the goodness of God. God, if you really loved me, then why don't you give me more wisdom to figure this out? Or if you really loved me, why didn't you give me the strength or the inner fortitude to not be so depressed? Or if you really loved me, why didn't you provide me with people that could help me do this thing you're telling me to do that I don't know to do? There's just countless times in your life you're gonna look in the mirror and you're gonna doubt the goodness of God. But this goes back to the opening of the message that this feeling of arrival, this feeling of adequacy, it is never met in a gym. It is never met with diplomas. It is never met with GPA. It is never met with net worth. Nothing in this world will ever quite satisfy you like the grace of Jesus Christ to, to conform you into the image of God. One of the things I love about living in Nashville is history. I, I love history. And we, my wife and I one day just wanted to burn a day and we went and looked at some Civil War sites in Franklin. And there's this one place, if you haven't been there, called the Carter House. I don't know if you've ever been to the Carter House, but it's this, this Civil War site and there's these little buildings and an outbuilding and the tour guide who has spent way too much of his life reading about this one thing <laughs> is telling us all about this house. And he brings us up to this little shed. And he says, this house came under the most heavy fire of any house. I think we, we think in the civil war. I mean, it was just bullet after bullet went through this house. And I'm looking at the house thinking, that's a pretty good looking little house. I mean, they put some paint on it. It looks decent. He goes, I know what you're thinking. Let me take you inside. And as we go inside, he goes, I want to warn you, we've taken the inner wall down so you can see what really happened there. And so we step into the Carter house and we see this image. And I'm standing there with my phone in hand and I feel the Holy Spirit say to me, this is you. This is you. This will always be you. And I don't have enough fingers to plug all those holes. But you know what scripture says? He who had no sin became sin so that you might become the righteousness of God that the only holes that Jesus has are the ones we put in him. And he came to the earth and died on a cross and rose from the grave so that you might rise from bed every day and not live with this perpetual feeling that you are not enough. That he started something in you, he's gonna finish it in you and from grace to grace, it lives. It is a thing of faith. It is by grace you have been saved and not by works so that nobody in this room can boast. You are not where you are today because of you. It's because of the grace of God. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And so if you think that your life is finally gonna feel fulfilled when you finally get it all together, you're gonna spend your life on a fool's errand. But the greatest day of your life is the day that you stop striving, stop trying to be somebody you're not, and just accept that God loves you exactly for who you are, and he is enough for you. So as we close, I just wanna give you a couple of seconds here to process what I'm saying. Will you just bow your heads? I wanna ask you three questions. First question. Do you have a Haman in your life? Is there a person that you feel like has it out for you? Is there a person that you love to hate? That you have a lot of bitterness toward? You can end that right now. You can pray something like this, Lord Jesus, I need the power to forgive. I need you to supply the power to let this person off the hook because I cannot punish them anymore. I'm exhausted. 
Would you give me the grace to show grace and to move forward with my life? Free me from all this poison that continues to fill up my heart. Or maybe you're here today and you're never satisfied and you wake up every day feeling like you're not enough and you're unworthy and you're not this and you're not that and you're just gonna strategically figure it out and it's not working. Maybe get on the grace plan today. Just call out to Jesus, Lord Jesus, I'm just never gonna be enough until you make me enough. I feel disappointed in myself. I feel like I've let people down. I feel like I've let myself down. I feel like there's holes all over the insides of my life. And would you just do what you can do and reach down and touch me and restore me and heal me and tell me that everything's gonna be okay? Today, I accept your grace as enough. Or maybe you're in this room and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. You've been around the church or around Christians, but you've never been in it. You've never fully devoted your life to Jesus Christ. You've never given him the chance to set you free from the law. And this morning, it can be your time, your moment, in your own breath to say, Lord Jesus, I invite you into the temple of my life. Clean me out. Make me new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Remove all this pain and anger and sorrow, the things that keep dragging me down. Make me a child of God. Make me a Christ follower. Make me a disciple. Make me new. Today, I receive you into my life. Today, I give you full control of my future. Today, I ask you in. Give me the strength to tell somebody, to go public with my faith and to tell the world what you have done inside of me. Lord Jesus, as we walk out these doors today, as we sing these songs, remind us that it's not by our works that we are worthy, but by your works, it's enough. And all of God's people said,